Stephen Kenneth Bunnell II, holy shit, that's a human name, also known by his nom de plume Destiny, is an American video game streamer whose opinions we apparently have to take seriously now. If you're a big Destiny fan, that's cool. I just chill out for a minute. I'm not gonna pick on him too bad. I just happen to think he's not very politically literate and sometimes he runs his mouth and gets himself into trouble. Now I totes get it. I'm some nobody and I get to throw out my opinions all over the internet and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Go ahead, dislike the video, fools. It only makes the algorithm consider me more engaging. Even now my power grows. Any clown can log on to YouTube and say whatever, and some people will listen, and that is okay. If people are gonna listen to me, a sweaty weirdo, talk about politics, then it must have been pretty exciting when an already famous person, in a pretty toxic field no less, decided to publicly de-pants alt-right weirdos. I mean, the first time I heard about Destiny was when he was styling on JonTron and added him as a white nationalist, which is a Weird political alignment for a Persian dude, but regardless, Destiny clowned on him, and that was fun. And it was good, and it was everybody liked it when he did that, and we were all tickled pink and pleased as punch. Why not? Why do we have to take immigration from all these areas? Because it helps Why? grow the size of the economy, and it brings talent in from other areas to continue to benefit the entire country. <laughs> it benefits the global elites. That's the only people it benefits. Dude, it doesn't you are benefit. like you make like millions of dollars making YouTube videos. You don't count as a global elite. <laughs> what are you? What are you talking? Are you like the working man now? So what are you gonna do when you got a content style at working? You're gonna keep it going, baby. Destiny started clowning on a greater variety of ding dongs, mostly far right YouTubers like Lauren Southern. Carl Benjamin and Count Dankula. Then something entirely unpredictable happened. Destiny pivoted to debating leftos, and now he's debating all sorts of communoids, like Peter Coffing, the Serfs, and the Michael Brooks. And he's very convinced the left are just a bunch of bozos, even though he doesn't understand the basics of what we believe. In a debate about anarchism with America Jonestown, Destiny had to have it explained to him that Marxism, Leninism, and anarchism are not the same thing. And he had to have it explained to him by an anarchist and a Marxist-Leninist. And they explained it a few times each. And by the end, I'm, I'm not so sure he actually grasped the distinction. Or that there was a distinction. He spent the whole debate trying to trap American in some sort of weak logic trap by selectively listening to his arguments and trying to own him with gotcha questions. And it kept blowing up in his face because he didn't understand the basic principles of what he was arguing against. He went into the discussion with the intention of winning, rather than coming away with a richer understanding of his opponent's worldview, which he'd already decided was not worth considering. In a way, that is kind of what makes Destiny a good debater. He's able to stay resolute in his beliefs and speak from a place of authority that is convincing to an audience. It's also what makes him a lazy thinker, who by his own admission is bored by the theoretical. Someone who doesn't really research the positions of his opponents, because he knows that all he has to do to defeat them is argue more forcefully than they do. He trusts that he can pick apart their position using only the context clues they drop in conversation. It's tempting to call this arrogance, and on a nuts and bolts level I suppose it sort of is, but I don't think it's because Destiny is dumb or a bad dude, though to be clear, sometimes this habit leads him to behave like a bad dude. And I remember that, yeah, no, no, wait, I want to talk to you about this. When I remember that when you told me that the, there's no evidence of communist, of stable communist country in the world. And you know why? Because of capitalism, capitalist country in the world fuck all us up. It's I mean, not, even if that was true, that's not my fault that your economic system is too weak to resist outside pressure. If anything, that's not oh argument for capitalism. I, well, Jeez. I'm sorry, like, if your countries yeah. roll over because they can't defend themselves, that sounds like a good argument for my oh system. My well, I'm sorry, sorry, but are you oh saying that they rolled over? Well, wouldn't that just... I think it's because his mind has been imprisoned. His imagination has been suppressed by the most insidious and ubiquitous brainwashing program the world has ever seen. It's called liberalism. Wait, what the frig, Thought Slime? What are you talking about? Uh-oh, I bet some of you are probably confused right now, particularly those that are new around these parts. You may have thought, based on your understanding of the left-right political spectrum, that as a leftist, I am therefore a liberal. 
You might consider values like LGBTQ plus rights, feminism, anti-racism, all things that I care deeply about, to be liberal values. You might be worried at this moment, I'm about to say some real conservative shit, because you've been taught that liberal and conservative are the boundaries of serious political discourse. And allow me to set your mind at ease. Shh. Shh. Find calm, my friend. I'm not a conservative. I'm not about to attack liberalism from the right. I want to attack it from the left. In fact, I actually think it's pretty incoherent for conservatives to attack liberalism because I consider conservatives to be liberals, albeit much shittier liberals with generally shittier haircuts. Liberalism is a centrist political ideology that supports individual freedoms, in theory, representative democracy, in theory, equality under the law, in theory, and free markets, i.e. capitalism, in practice. On the surface, that sounds like a bunch of good things with one bad thing thrown in for flavor, and I very much stress here on the surface because I have my qualms about representative democracy even in its most idealized form. But there is a contradiction at the heart of liberalism. Individual freedoms, equality under the law, and capitalism cannot coexist. Capitalism by its very nature creates inequality and undermines individual liberty. You cannot have equality under the law when some people can afford to mount expensive lawsuits, keep defense lawyers on retainer, or lobby policymakers to tailor the law to suit their interests. Congrats, both you and Chevron have the same legal right to hydrofrac without worrying about whether or not you're going to poison the local drinking water. And while that may be equality under the law in the strictest sense, it's not meaningful equality because it's designed to only benefit a select few people. The idea is that laws apply equally, but that doesn't guarantee that they represent people equally. Likewise, you cannot have individual freedoms when your ability to survive is contingent on whether or not you obey your boss, whether or not you can pay your landlord, you can pay for your groceries, your power bill, whether you can pay for your medication. The very nature of capitalism and commodity production are fundamentally at odds with your ability to live freely. The methods that liberals suggest to fix this contradiction have failed time and again, and always will because they're not actually interested in solving the problem, which is capitalism, because that is fundamental to their world view. They believe that these systemic injustices are natural and unsolvable, so the best we can hope for is a free market with strong regulatory practices put in place by a vigilant state to keep the market in check. And that certainly seems reasonable when you compare it to the other solution that mainstream politics offers, which is, I don't know, fuck it, let's just do whatever we want, and it might kill everybody, but we'll make some money. And let's not get it twisted, sometimes regulations do a real good job. Sometimes they have a very positive influence. Like for example, we don't use leaded gasoline anymore, thanks regulations! Of course, leaded gasoline was only sold in the first place because it was profitable to do so, so in the absence of the profit motive, it's a problem that wouldn't have needed solving in the first place. But still, regulations did it, they fixed it. And I mean, sure, the whole process got tied up in the courts for decades because the only science on the effect of lead exposure in humans that these regulatory bodies considered as evidence was conducted by people who literally worked for lead companies. But you gotta give the system a little credit here, okay? It came to the right conclusion, and it only took 50 years of delays while thousands of metric tons of neurotoxic chemicals were pumped into the atmosphere for no reason, poisoning the entire Earth. What were they supposed to do? People had only known that lead was toxic for a couple of thousand years. The, these regulatory bodies were on the cutting edge of modern ancient Roman science. And they've kept us safe ever since, which is why climate change is not poised to destroy the human race within, say, 10 years. And just look how seriously our leaders are taking it. Like, for example, there is this recent crisis where the Amazon rainforests in Brazil were just burning down because the Bolsonaro administration is full of lunatics. And our leaders stepped up to the plate and boldly ignored it or didn't even notice. We're saved! We're honestly probably all gonna die, I don't even know why I'm making this video. Liberalism sells itself as a means to keep capital in check. With democracy and regulatory agencies, we can leverage the power of the state to prevent richos from running rampant over everyone else. If you work within the system, you can affect change without the need for violence, without any of those messy revolutions that could backfire, that could make things even worse for you.
Problem is, the richos have just as much ability to leverage that power against our interests. Which is to say they actually have a lot more power to do that because they can pay thousands of people to do it for them. They can fund entire political campaigns. They can bribe officials. They can bit by bit erode legal protections against cronyism and corruption and let everyone else exhaust their political capital trying to win them back. Not to mention, they're also signing your fucking paycheck. So how hard are you really going to fight them exactly? We can't progress forward under capitalism because there's always a dedicated cabal of rich ghouls trying to pull us backwards. And within capitalism, there always will be, because our interests conflict with theirs. That's why large corporations and billionaires manage to take over all relevant political parties and carefully tailor their agendas not to interfere with the interests of the rich and powerful. All of the mechanisms that we would use to protect ourselves from the whims of the rich become recuperated and controlled by the rich. That is a feature of liberalism, not a bug. The purpose of liberalism, the reason an ideology theoretically underpinned on the idea of placing limits on the influence of the rich and powerful became useful to the rich and powerful, is that it functions as a mental filter, a way to place a limit on the possibilities one is able to imagine to combat injustice, by presenting a comforting illusion of control. You can vote for a candidate that represents your interests. I mean, sure, there might not be one that represents your interests, but you can choose whichever politician you like to vote for among the small pool of ones that matter. You're in control. Hey, are you concerned about the environment? You can buy the laundry detergent with the green cap on it. And it's got a picture of a mountain on it, so that's good for the environment. You're in control. Hey, are you worried about all the genocides your country is committing? Well, don't worry, you can write a strongly worded letter to your local representative. And a few months later, you'll receive a form letter saying that they take this issue very seriously. And also, they spelled your name wrong. You're in complete control. Now what you don't want to do, what nobody wants you to do, is act outside of the system. That's brash, that's dangerous, there's no way to control that. That's not serious political thought. Real quick, I probably would agree like with most, like any, any slow reform that works, I'm always in favor of. So if you think flattening hierarchies makes people's lives better or lets them keep more money or whatever, if you start slowly doing this in some factories and it, and it ends up like empirically working, then I'm 100% in favor of that. And I would hope that most people would be as well too. Liberals are horny for the idea of gradual reform. You can't make too big a change, who knows what'll happen. All of the changes you make have to be incremental and easily reversible, and oops, wouldn't you know it, they got reversed by the next group of ding-dongs in power. Now you've gotta win them all back again. Round and round you go, and where you end up, everybody thinks it's pretty obvious if you think about it for even five. It's a stopgap that prevents the public from resisting when the government or capital act against their best interest. It quells discontent by funneling all political will into the directions that the system controls, and convincing everyone that any other expression of political unrest is illegitimate. Any civil disobedience which is successful is revised in the history books until it appears as though it worked within the system thereby demonstrating the system's flexibility and fairness. The civil rights movement, for example, faced severe state repression, were accused of being terrorists and inciting riots. But then a couple of decades later, when everyone can look back with the benefit of hindsight and realize actually the civil rights movement ruled, all the textbooks say that everything they did that was successful was thanks to passive resistance. So if you want to fight injustice, you too should be passive. If the system can work for them, and you're just going to have to take my word for it that it did, it definitely did, it worked for them, it worked great, then it'll work for you too. You just have to trust it, okay? And then you'll be fine. Just don't rock the boat too much. Any civil unrest which acts outside the system and is unsuccessful becomes demonstrative of how only working within the established boundaries can be productive. Occupy Wall Street failed because these hippy-dippy kids failed to get the right zoning permits, and that's just not how you get things done in the real world. You want to resist the government? That's fine. It's your right. Go ahead. Just make sure you fill out the right paperwork and get the government's permission before you start resisting them. Bit by bit, limits are placed on the liberal imagination until they can no longer conceive of any sort of political action outside the boundaries of liberalism. It isn't simply that they disagree with other ideologies, though of course they do. It's that they're completely unable to even picture a society that isn't liberal succeeding or being desirable to anyone. Therefore, the transgressions of any liberal government are just things that happened. 
At, they're just individual failures. They're not related to liberalism in any way. But the transgressions of any non-liberal government are proof that only liberal governments can work in the 21st century. Take, for example, this baloney of a tweet, where Destiny talks about how using the hammer and sickle flag means condoning the holodomir. Any support for that system means tacitly being okay with starvation and genocide. Okay, well, what about this flag? Or th this flag? Or what about this flag? Does flying these flags signify tacit support for slavery, genocide, colonialism, or manufactured famines? If the hammer and sickle are equivalent to a swastika, why aren't these, dog? And just side note, I think all of these flags are bad, but let's be real here, let's cut through the bullshit. None of them are as bad as a swastika, and before I get accused of colonialist apologia, let me explain what I mean by that. While all of these countries have committed and are committing hideous atrocities, most people fly these flags because it's like the place that they live or were born. They don't really think about it that much. When you fly a swastika flag, you're announcing your intention to start murdering minorities. All of these flags have been flown while minorities have been murdered, of course, but only one of them is used exclusively to signal support for the murder of minorities. To pretend otherwise is to make excuses for the most dangerous right-wing goons on the planet. The type who are organizing and rallying support for their murderous ideologies right now. Liberals will always make the distinction between liberal nations who may have done bad things and non-liberal countries, which are just essentially bad because they did bad things. To them, the crimes of liberal governments, up to and including ongoing genocide, are incidental to liberalism, but the crimes of other governments are essential to that style of governance. The upshot of this is that you can't really use any bad outcomes of liberal policy to argue with them, because they refuse to see the connection between the outcomes of liberalism and liberalism itself. Look at all the, those hungry people in Venezuela, a definitely socialist country. Well, it just goes to show is socialism doesn't work, because people go hungry. Yep, that's why we need capitalism like we have here in my country. Oh hey, there's a homeless guy in my neighborhood begging for change so that he can buy food. Don't know what happened there, I assume. A goblin must have stolen his wallet. <coughs> Hello and welcome to the Eyeball Zone, where I promote small leftos who need eyeballs on their work. You know what everybody loves? Spooky video games. On August 30th, 6 p.m. BST, which I think stands for British Standard Time, I don't know, probably should have looked that up before I started recording this. Twitch streamer Brett Midwig will be uh, playing Resident Evil with their husband to raise money for Amnesty International. It's, uh, you, you, the link is in the description to their Twitch channel. You can go check that out. You don't have to wait till August 30th. You can go right now. You know what? Life's too short. Go check it out. Hey, do you need eyeballs on some explicitly leftist project? Well, just send a dang old email to thoughtslimeeditor at gmail.com and I'll see if I can hook you up. But maybe I can't because I get a lot of these emails. Oh, well, I'm trying. Now we return to our regularly scheduled programming. There's a very frustrating exchange between Non-Compete and Destiny, where Destiny asks how an anarchist factory would deal with a majority white workforce using its majority to force racist legislation on the entire group. American points out a number of ways that could be resolved, theoretically, but ultimately concedes that no method of labor organizing can solve racism. And Destys think this is a real slam-dunk argument. Checkmate, Anarchities. Racism is still possible in a factory, even if you're anarchist. Checkmate. And I mean, Homeboy's not wrong to say that anarchist labor organizing alone won't solve racism. I mean, he's wrong to suggest that we think that. For the record, we don't. What, what, what he misses is he never turns that analysis inwards towards the society that he's defending. Imagine a big factory making goo gaws. 70% of the workers are white, 30% are black, in this hypothetical factory that I've made up. In this made-up anarchist society, each worker has a commiserate amount of ownership and say over the way that the factory is run and what is done with the goo gaws it produces. If the white workers decided to stiff the black workers, they'd have majority control and they could do that. Pretty good example of a situation where collective ownership can run into problems. Good job so far. 
Now, let's take a look at the same example in a liberal capitalist model. The decisions are no longer made by consensus, they're made by one dude, the boss. And since white workers outnumber black workers almost two to one, he's likely to be white even if we don't factor in institutionalized racism. Now, a white person gets to make decisions unilaterally. The black workers have gone from 30% control over their workplace to 0%, which is not exactly liberating. Aha! Uh -huh. Ding dong! In a liberal society, I can ask government for help. You know, if the laws are on your side, and also the laws are enforced, and also you're not afraid of losing your job or being retaliated against, and also your employee hasn't found a loophole, like just pretending that all of his bullshit is based on performance rather than race, and also if all of those conditions are met, there's really nothing stopping your employer from just screwing over all of their employees rather than improving conditions for black employees. If you live in a liberal democracy, you might notice that there's still systematic racism. The regulations that were meant to address this problem didn't fix it. Now, they've helped, and we're meant to treat that as sufficient. Giving direct control of the workplace to the worker, I would argue, would also, on its own, fail to solve this problem. But it would also, likewise, help a great deal. But that, somehow, is woefully insufficient. So yeah, this is a problem that could come up in an anarchist society. You know, if anarchists decided the only thing that we wanted to do was organize factories, and then decide, revolution done! No need to solve other problems, everybody? That everything's gonna be fine. Good job, comrades. Let's all go get Popeyes. Couldn't think of a funny thing they'd be getting. I don't know. Is Popeyes funny? I don't know if that joke was funny. But even if it's a problem that could come up in an anarchist society, it's also a problem that has happened and is happening in liberal societies right now. That's incidental for liberalism, but essential for the system he's critiquing because he can imagine it. The system he's critiquing, by the way, doesn't exist, so we can say it has all sorts of problems. It's full of vampires! What if people's legs fall off? Now, in fairness to him, we don't have data for what a hypothetical anarchist world would look like. We have some small data samples for anarchist countries, which seem to do pretty dang good, all things considered, but we'll never know until we try. At some point, every economic system, every political system, every fucking idea was untried. Liberalism was a new idea at one point, and they fought bloody revolutions to install that. It's pretty convenient that after the fact it became too dangerous to try new ideas without some arbitrary amount of data. Don't you think? No, we just have to stick with our current model, because at least we have the data to know that it doesn't work and will destroy Earth. And that's how the liberal mind prison works. It's a difficult problem to solve because we're fighting against a complicit education system and mass media. Anyone can make a single compelling argument against the liberal. But can you make 12 years of compelling arguments between the key developmental ages of 5 and 17? Can you reinforce those compelling arguments with a complete hegemony over all mainstream political discourse? No, you can't. Don't say that you can, because you can't do it. And look, I get it. Even making a good argument can be difficult because it's easy to get frustrated with liberal smugness and just want to yell at him. Just fucking stop thinking this way. I don't really know how to solve that problem entirely, but I'd like to offer one suggestion. When arguing with a liberal, or anyone else for that matter, never justify your position without demanding that they also justify theirs. The purpose of this is simple, to demonstrate to liberals that their positions are not just the default. They're not just the natural way things are, they're a choice. They're an ideological position just like anyone else's that must be justified. Getting these wieners to consider that they even have a position is half of the battle. Getting them to recognize that their assumptions about the world require justification and can't just be taken as a given. You can take them out of the liberal mind prison by forcing them to make their case. Now, they might remain liberal afterwards, in fact, they probably will, but it means they have to prove themselves to you just as much as you have to prove yourselves to them. Passionately pleading our case and letting them sit back and poke holes lets them continue to imagine themselves as the judges of reasonability. It lets them play pretend like they know what is and is not realistic. It makes them the authority in the conversation you must win over. And don't give them that. Make them justify themselves to you.
And here's, here's, a, here's a thought slime original you can have for free. If they start complaining about the death toll of socialism, whatever ridiculous number they believe that to be, go ahead and ask them uh, how they feel about the fact that capitalism is leading us towards climate collapse and will literally kill all people in the world unless it's stopped. That's not a real easy thing to justify. There's not, well, well okay, sure, it's gonna kill all of us, but I got an iPhone. Did you see Avengers Endgame? It's pretty cool. Fans finally got to see Spider-Man and Rocket Raccoon together on the screen. Good, top that, socialists. What are you going what kind of movies are you gonna make? Are they even gonna have Groot in them? Are you socialist movies even gonna have Groot? Didn't think so. Hello, it's me, Thought Slime. I'm back again. I'd like to give a shout out to Alex from Lost in the Fold who made this ridiculously adorable little thought slime guy, a little paper fold up toy. Hey, does my voice sound different? It's because I recorded this part at a separate time. Don't forget to check out her video in the description that goes over her design process. It also gets into what it's like as a designer to do political work and the considerations involved with that. And it's just a really well done video essay. I highly recommend you check it out and would even if it wasn't tangentially about me. Scrolling above you, you'll see a bunch of drawings and names. Those are people that donated to me on Patreon. Uh, if you donate to me at the new $15 tier, you can get a downloadable copy of the Thought Slime paper fold-up toy. I put one together recently, and I can tell you it was a lot of fun. I'm actually going to put one together on stream sometime soon. I also have a Ko-fi link for one-time donations if Patreon isn't your thing. Don't feel compelled to give to either, but if you can, that would be nice for me. It would also be nice for me if you clicked like on the video and subscribe to me here on youtube.com. But as previously stated, you can hit dislike if you feel so inclined. You will make a powerful enemy this day, but nothing you do has the power to stop me. I cannot be destroyed. I cannot be killed. If you jangle YouTube's stupid little bell icon thing, then you can... Be notified when I'm live streaming, which is at least once a week, uh, every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And those are the things that I have to say at the end of every video. You've probably heard them a lot by now. You've probably already turned off the video by now. Now I can say all of my secrets and no one will hear them.